Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have a great show for you today. I am very pleased to be joined by Michael LaRosa, who is filling in for Jessica Burbank today. Michael, great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Amber. What's up first today? So we have former Trump economic advisor Peter Navarro, who was found guilty Thursday of contempt of Congress following a jury deliberation that lasted nearly five hours. Navarro faced two counts of contempt of Congress for refusing to cooperate with a subpoena served by the House Committee investigating the events of January 6. The first charge pertained to his failure to produce documents, and the second was for failing to appear for a deposition. Here's Navarro after the ruling. Let's watch. This is a landmark case. This is a landmark case that's bound for the Supreme Court. Why do I say that? <clears throat> this is the first time in the history of our republic that a senior White House advisor, an alter ego of the president, has ever been charged with the alleged crime. That's the first time that this has ever happened. Well, what do you think? Is this a worthwhile charge? Do you think that this was something that should have been pursued by the Department of Justice? Or is this a, well, a you know, I always thought it was weird that they were allowed to get away with defying congressional subpoenas. I mean, my God, if the Clinton White House had known they could defy uh, congressional subpoenas, um, it, it may have turned out differently with, with them, but they all complied. I mean, uh, I think it shows that you're not above the law, that even if you work in the White House and uh, Congress asks you or basically asks nicely compels you compels and then compels you <laughs> to come testify you do it i mean you are you are held accountable to the taxpayers when you are a government employee um so look i think it's a it's a valuable lesson but again he's not the first i, I, I don't know if he's i don't know if he's the first to be charged but i mean obviously nixon's aides were charged with f federal crimes um i don't know what he's talking about he's kind of a blowhard if you ask me he's come a long way from running for congress as a democrat in northern california that's for sure well he was one of the architects of trump's trade policy with china so blowhard i'm not so sure but there's some context here that i think i'm not saying he's not smart i'm just saying <laughs> sure I, I i think there's some context here that makes this seem to me like it was uh, more of a political process than it was actually trying to just hold somebody accountable for breaking the law. It's incredibly rare that the DOJ will actually pursue contempt of Congress charges. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that Congress will even refer them to the DOJ in the first place. There is a similar situation under the Obama administration where Eric Holder defied a subpoena and instead of trying to go after him criminally, what House Republicans did at that time was they sued him in civil court. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, that case lasted seven years. He obviously was never facing any prison time. Peter Navarro might actually go to jail for several years. The sentencing is coming up in January. And the other issue I have with this is the entire January 6th committee was a total sham. It was a show trial. There were no Republican selections allowed on that committee. We had Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, who already had their minds made up and were basically with the Democrats the entire time. The Republicans didn't have the same level of subpoena power. They didn't have the same investigatory power on that committee. This was a hand-picked committee by Nancy Pelosi. It was entirely politicized. So for them to turn around and say, if you don't comply with our completely partisan investigation, which is hardly a whole of Congress investigation, we're going to send you to prison is ridiculous. Well, I don't know where to begin with that, Amber. Um, a couple of things. First of all, um, Peter Navarro, whatever brilliance he may have when it comes to trade policy, was staff. Uh, Eric Holder was the attorney general of the United States, the chief law enforcement officer. So he's above the uh, law? He's above Peter Navarro, I'll, I'll tell you that mm. much. Maybe that's why they didn't charge him criminally and just civilly. Um, however, uh, again, when you're called to testify before Congress, and in this case, this was about um, a crime committed by the president, a high crime and misdemeanor that he was found guilty of. Well, I'm sorry, he wasn't found guilty of, that he was impeached for, indicted for. Um, and um, to, to the point about the January 6th committee, I don't know how you can call it a sham. I mean, I think President Trump was even quite annoyed with the strategy that Republicans 
deployed, which was to not provide any. They were certainly welcomed. Nancy Pelosi did not did not deny Republicans the chance to be on that committee. I think it was supposed to be ev- like even. I think it was supposed to be evenly distributed. Uh, right, but she fact. had. She said and that she had was, veto power on every person had, the Republican she, chose. Well, she's the speaker. She right. certainly does have veto but, power. But but when you select members who don't believe that the crime occurred in the first place, then there's a problem. So you have to select you have to select members um, who are going to join the committee who agree with the intent of the committee, and that was to investigate a crime. And the members he chose just did not. But the members that they had he the, chose they wanted certain, they wanted to investigate portions of what happened on January 6th. They wanted to investigate the failure of security. The fact that Nancy Pelosi herself rejected having additional support from the National Guard or the D.C. police on that day. They wanted to investigate well, the entire response. She doesn't response. control the, the D.C. police or the federalizing the National Guard. And I believe it was up to the Secretary of Defense. And she was you could see the video of her begging the Secretary of Defense. On the day, uh, but the not day. prior to. Yes. Prior well, to, she rejected. I don't know if uh, anybody in the world could have predicted what the FBI uh, did. insurrection. The FBI did. They, 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 had, they had actionable intel an that there was going to be potential violence happening on that day that came out in the course of the Republican investigation that was outside of the January 6th committee. And the Republican investigation? They had documents that came out that found that the FBI did, in fact, have actionable intel that they believed that there could be violence on that day. Well, of course, and Trump knew, was aware of we, it, too. We knew and that's that. why he requested that, the that, National Guard to come in. So why did, we knew. So why did Nancy Pelosi not want the National Guard there. I don't know if that if that she didn't want the National Guard there. All I know is when she asked for it, uh, she was it was it was like pulling teeth to get them there. And it was after people had been killed. Who who got killed on January 6th? I believe the woman in the Capitol. The, right. That was. Uh-huh. Yeah. And the man who died from a heart attack after after being uh, pounded with a That's not uh, true. after being pounded with a flagpole. The- um and I believe there was a suicide as a result of it. There afterwards. were police officers who passed away after January 6th. No police officers died on that day. No, there was one that died on that That's day. That's not I true. I forget his name, but he was honored at the Capitol. That's not true. He didn't die on that day. He didn't die as a result of that day. Uh, the only person Officer who, Sisnick? Officer Sisnick had a stroke two right. days later. right. And there's no, there's but no. But he was beaten up pretty badly. But there's no. We don't credible, know if he would have had the stroke if he wasn't beaten with a flagpole. Well, there's no evidence that his injuries sustained on that day had mm. anything to do with his well, stroke. I, his family says and the medical, otherwise. His well, family the, and the Capitol police. Well, the police, medical records don't lie. His family and the Capitol police say otherwise. Medical records don't lie. But let's get back to this question of Peter Navarro, because one of the other issues with this case, in my opinion, is the fact that Peter Navarro said that he was under executive privilege, which is the same exact claim that was made by Mark Meadows and other senior Trump officials. And they were not charged with contempt of Congress. And yet the judge rejected his ability to make that argument in court. And their reasoning was that Peter Navarro, uh, sort of similar to what you said about Eric Holder, apparently wasn't high enough up in the administration yes. to credibly be well, under executive privilege. Welcome to government. The, the chief he, of staff has an armed guard outside his door. He has security. Um, the chief of staff has a security clearance that Peter Navarro, no offense to his intelligence, did not have. A very different, very but different lines of work. But the security clearance is separate from the question of executive privilege. No, Peter Navarro was incredibly what I'm doing is he providing you the- like it, uh, supporting evidence as to why a chief of staff in a White House is um, of a different level of seniority than um, oh, I under- and, and, and I privilege. I understand that, and but in the, in, the Trump, in the Trump administration, Peter Navarro was incredibly close to the president. That's okay. And did I'm have- incre- I'm, I, was, I'm, I was incredibly close to Jill Biden. I didn't have a security clearance as high as the chief of staff. But there's a potential that you would be protected under executive privilege if you're someone who has one-on-one meetings in the Oval Office with the president Mm. on routine occasion. Mm. And they wouldn't even allow him to make that argument in court, just like we're debating right now. He wasn't even allowed to bring it up. I don't think it's ridiculous at all. He's staff. He is a senior official. There's nothing new about uh, the White House chief of staff having executive privilege and uh, other members of the White House staff do not. That's just they, the way it goes. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even look into whether or not he had executive privilege. They could have made a call to the president. They could have asked anybody in the administration. And instead, they said flat out, no, you're not allowed to bring this into court. Good for them. 
Good for them. Yes. All right. Well, <laughs> I'd like to hear what he has to say. All right. So uh, if you're the attorney general under the Obama administration, then you don't uh, get to be held in contempt of Congress. But if you're Peter Navarro, you do. Well, I, I, OK, well, we should be clear. Uh, whenever Eric Holder was asked to testify before Congress, which he did routinely, I think once every couple of weeks, um, as a result of being a cabinet member, uh, it's not like he escaped or was hiding anything. Hmm. Interesting. I think the Fast and Furious scandal would disagree, but we're going to have to leave it there. We'll be back with more Rising after this. <laughs> 